If you enjoyed the channel and our video content and would like to support us, you can do this in a couple of ways. You can sign up to our Patreon site which is a monthly subscription to one of our four tiers, each giving you something different from early access interviews up to exclusive unseen footage. There's also the option of a one-off donation via PayPal which allows you the option to donate an amount of your choice. Both options really help to keep this channel going and to continue putting out regular content for you good folk. So please take a look at aircurrentreview.tv forward slash donate and I thank you in advance. Thank you and enjoy. kind of touched on the cockpit before did it take much getting used to uh, like obviously all the three glass screens like did you was it natural uh, coming from the phantom being an all analog gauge though do you know what it, it wasn't natural uh, it wasn't natural at all but it was a very quick learn um, so their um, their cockpit trainers the simulators were were superb um, they really were <clears throat> you could sign them out on your own uh, pull up targets and do uh, radar intercepts um, just in the cockpit trainer that got you used to using the um, uh, the displays. Head up display took a bit of getting used to when, and then after five times flying with it I wondered how I'd ever flown an aeroplane without <laughs> it uh, uh, before so um, it, it, I think a, a quite a quick uh, quite a quick learn with that because it was so intuitive um, people talk about um, Typhoon. Typhoon is a brilliant aeroplane and it was designed from the pilot outwards. Yeah. Um, I think F-18 was the first aeroplane that where they really tried to do that, but didn't quite manage it, but, um, but tried to do it. And a lot of the stuff that you'll see in Typhoon is lifted from the, from the F-18. Yeah, it looks very similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to ask, did you land on the board? I didn't. Do you know what? Um, if I was to say one regret, it was the fact that I'd, I never did the uh, never did the boat. So the the story being that had I stayed on the OCU, um, I could have um, done a workup to be um, boat qualified and then teach um, the boat. I think it would have taken a lot of uh, a lot of time and effort to do that because we were out on the front line. Um, there was a thing called the Status of Forces Agreement, and we weren't allowed to deploy at the time on the boat. Right. So. Being on the front line, it was deemed uh, a waste of hours to get us uh, boat qualified. To tell you the truth, um, did I fancy spending four weeks just doing circuits around a boat, living mm. in a stinking carrier when I could be on the beach in Ocean Beach? Maybe not, you yeah. know, <laughs> and, and I think missing out on the boat was a big deal but um, it, it was, my desires were fulfilled with all sorts of other things I did on the front line. And I wouldn't change that, go to the OCU and just to get the boat, mm -hmm. get the boat done, yeah. So what are the main differences between the Marine Hornets and the US Navy? Is there much difference there in the way they train, operate? I don't know, to tell you the truth. I never came across any, it is odd, isn't it? I never yeah. came across any US Navy Hornet uh, uh, guys. So right. um, El Toro, uh, sorry, um, Miramar was becoming all marine. Yeah. <clears throat> now bear in mind, uh, you know, Top Gun was, uh, was based there, um, but it was becoming all marine. There was an F-14D squadron there when I, when I arrived, but they all moved out and uh, across to Oceania on, mm. the, on the other coast, as, just as we arrived. So I only ever saw Marine Corps F-18s. Um, saw plenty of US Navy F-14s, but no, uh, no F-18s. I think the only difference between them would be the person in the cockpit. Uh, Marines are a different breed to the US Navy. We always have this, uh, uh, this thing, uh, uh, as fighter pilots, we always pick at other, uh, other aeroplanes, <laughs> other fleets, yeah. Um, but the US Air Force is, is pretty anal and inflexible. Yeah. They've got, they're very, very disciplined, but uh, I always found them quite inflexible. Always found the US Navy a bit kind of gash, you know, um, brilliant around the boat, but um, when it came to who actually matches the Air Force, the mm -hmm. Royal Air Force. The Marine Corps are almost our brothers in arms, I think. Okay, right. Uh, they're, they're much more aligned to the way that we used to do things in the Royal Air Force, and that's why it was such a good fit, I think. Was there many uh, Marines that went to the RAF on exchange as well? Yeah, so um, I, it, it's not strictly, you know, I was over there, therefore one, one of them one. Was, yeah. uh, was over here. But the Marine Corps exchange, um, there used to be two of them at uh, Lucas on the uh, Phantom. 
and that was a straight phantom to phantom uh, swap and then they started getting the F18 um, and they started sending guys to the F3 at, uh, at Lucas. There was always a couple of Harrier Marine Corps yeah. uh, exchanges and guys would go across, our guys would go and fly the AV-8B out of uh, Yuma. Um, but that, that was, uh, oh, and there was, uh, gosh, what was it? Um, up at uh, Whidbey Island, maybe there was, uh, you know, Charlie 130 exchange maybe mm. on, on Marines uh, as well, and some helicopter stuff. Good stuff. You have many, I'm sure, but uh, can you share maybe one standout moment from flying with the Marines and on the Hornet? Do you know, I was, uh, I was thinking about this this morning, Mike, <laughs> as I was driving up. Um, again, um, I've probably got about 30 great experiences, uh, but I'll, I'll just do the first one then. Um, I, I got onto VMFA 121 and part of your yearly um, currency is to do DACT, 1v1 DACT. And uh, we had the resident F-14D squadron and the F-14D had massive engines. Oh, yeah. and, uh, and so I was up with my boss in the back seat and we were going up against uh, an F-14D and everybody was warning me. Bear in mind I had less than 100 hours on the Hornet at this time. Everybody was warning me, the F-14D, it'll, it'll outpower you, it'll race around the circle quicker than you and, and such like this. So what you have to do is fly, the, the Marine Corps and the US Navy fly, used to fly um, air combat a little bit by numbers energy management diagrams, yeah. this is your best turn speed at, at stuff. Whereas we taught people to look out of the window and fight what you see mm. and try and dictate things a little bit. So uh, I briefed up with the boss and uh, I had all this uh, great advice from all the other pilots on the squadron because there was a bit of, you know, squadron into rivalry going, God, we met this F-14 crew. They were massive. I mean, the, the guys were massive. They were like <laughs> linebackers out of a... Um, uh, American football yeah, team, yeah. and the, and their mm. pilot, he was um, he was one of their flight commanders, and, it, and he had this huge kind of reputation and whatnot. And when they briefed us, they had this kind of arrogance about them, and that mm. really annoys me. Oh, yeah. So um, so anyway, uh, off they go. And I said to the boss, I said, look, I, I know you want me to fly this. They call it a yardstick Hornet, you know, merging about 320 knots and stuff. I said, I'm going to try something a bit different. And uh, and I told him what I was going to try, and he said. Yeah, okay, so what if it doesn't work? I said, well, then I will be working my nuts off to <laughs> claw back the advantage that I've just given them. But these guys expected us to fly on numbers. I did something different. They tried to power out of it by going vertical. I just shot an AMRAM at the, their backside. Wow. And um, because they didn't think I could get the nose, uh, nose round in time for them to come back towards us. And that was it. And as soon as you lose the first fight, you are screwed for the rest of the trip oh, really? because you're off your game then. Right. They expect to win the first fight. I expect that I'm going to try my best to win the first fight. Whoever loses the first fight, it doesn't matter after that because fight, fight two and three, you're not in it because you got shot on the first one. That's, that's the mindset. But they don't have that, that, that kind of really aggressive go after them mindset or they ah. didn't on that day because I, th I think they just thought their jet could outpower us. And once they'd lost the first fight, and now it's a bit embarrassing for them. They were all over the place after that. We had three fights and, and absolutely destroyed them. Got back in the, um, uh, in the crew room and, and we're just regaling these tales. I've got to say, that makes me sound like I'm ace of the base fighter pilot, Mike. Not the case. That Hornet was spectacular. Yeah. And with a little bit of lateral thought, you could take it to a place that the numbers couldn't really take you. Yeah. yeah. Did you have a debrief after that with them? Yeah, yeah. What yeah. was that like? It's all very, uh, <laughs> what, what, what I love about it is that um, the results don't lie in these things. Trust me, I've had my ass handed to me a number of times uh, and in the Hornet as well. I flew against an ex-Top Gun instructor and he was all over me like a rash. And it was a very humbling experience. So if people come into a debrief with a, a kind of humble uh, attitude, then I'm okay with that. Yeah. If they come in and try and fight fire with fire, you know, and the, and the score's 3-0, then they're, 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 they're just pushing it uphill from, from that point on. Yeah. So we were, we were very, um, we didn't lord it over them. We were, we were very, uh, 
uh, kind of circumspect in uh, in what we said. We all agreed it was a lot of fun, and let's do it again sometime, and and all that, you know. What a brilliant story. Yeah. So yeah. So how long did you spend over there? And I can imagine you enjoyed every minute of it. Three years of a dream, and uh, and that was it. I had um, I had some times where I wasn't flying for quite a bit. So the OCU, I said, wasn't great for uh, continuity of flying. And then between VMFA 121 and VMFA 134, I had three months on the ground mm. uh, because we uh, 121 deployed to uh, Iwakuni. We weren't we weren't allowed to deploy, thank goodness, because they were away for six months. Um, so uh, right, where do you want to put me then? And they couldn't find another squadron um, because the sta status of forces agreement was starting to rear its ugly head. And then eventually, after a couple of months, they went. Well, we've got a reserve unit. Do you fancy doing that? Yeah, why not? You know, what single seat Hornets? Awesome, yeah. <laughs> and so I flew, uh, flew the second half single seat. Three years, loved every second, uh, every second of it. Yeah. Have you still got lifelong friends from your time? There? I've got, um, I've got people that we, as air crew, we live a very transient life. So for three years, these people are your absolute best friends. And then you drift away and you keep in touch. I went to the 92 Squadron reunion uh, a couple of months ago. These are people I've, um, I served with 25 years ago. And uh, two or three of those are still my best friends. Um, I keep in touch with a couple of the guys, um, a couple of Marines I flew with on the reserves at, uh, um, uh, at Miramar. And uh, that's just the lifestyle that we lead. What we do know is that, um, say I were to <clears throat> randomly bump into one of them in a bar in Las Vegas when I'm on holiday, uh, we could pick up where we, uh, where we left off and, and that's a very military aircrew sort of thing as well. Absolutely brilliant. So Tug, what was it like going from the Hornet to the F3? Oh, I, um, I feel I feel bad for the F3. Okay, it's <laughs> it's not gonna it's not gonna measure up to the uh, to the Hornet. There were some good things. I was looking forward to be, being on a um, British fighter squadron again. Uh, I was looking forward to flying um, with a navigator again. A, a lot of people have this thing that you know single seat's the only way to go. Uh, you've got to be top dog and and all that sort of stuff. I loved flying with navigators. I loved having somebody else in the cockpit. Uh, we were so much better than just one person in the cockpit. And if you divert somebody somewhere, you got somewhere somebody to have a beer with uh, oh, yeah. uh, straight away. So I loved that whole thing. So I was looking forward to twin seat again. The F3 had a terrible reputation among uh, among fighters. Some of it deserved, some of it, uh, some of it not. So, but the bottom line was, I'd had my tour in paradise. I was never going to be able to stay there for the rest of my life what's next you know and um and to get a third fast jet in my logbook to fly it at the front line is was something special in those days you know un, unheard of i know some people have got three or four but but we're the we're the exception not not the uh, not the rule so it was going to be something else in my logbook and I, i'll be honest with you i went to the f3 ocu completely open mind and just thought well let's see what it can what it can do for me and did, when you went to the OCU, did everyone know you just come from the Hornet? Yeah, yeah. Right. So uh, there was um, uh, a certain, I, I suppose, a certain amount of, um, you know, looking sideways at this guy because uh, here he is coming from the Hornet. <laughs> I, I, I bet they thought I probably thought I knew it all. Um, when I didn't, I've, I've never been, uh, never been really like that. Yeah, I've got this kind of fighter pilot uh, bravado about me, but that's all part of the thing of how to win a fight and, and such. But I, I came here thinking, I, I don't know how to do intercepts in UK airspace. I know how to okay. do UK air defence. So I've just not done them in a Tornado F3 uh, uh, before. And bearing in mind, I've been running my own radar for the last uh, three years. Mm -hmm. um, I do know how to handle a radar and, and, and what uh, an intercept is supposed to look like and a bit of weaponeering. So, um, I, but still had an open mind about the uh, aeroplane when I, when I turned up. And what would you say are the strengths and weaknesses of the F3 and uh, how did it compare to the Hornet in certain areas? Right, so uh, with, with, this, uh, with this aeroplane, um, it's the fastest aeroplane I've ever flown. Um, down at low level, it was slippery as anything. Nothing could get away from, uh, from this, not in an F-111. Um, so, but you got it above um, 5,000 feet and it started to become a bit of a 
gutless uh, gutless tub. The the engines were maximised for low level um, uh, intercept because that's what we thought we were going to be intercepting Russian uh, uh, missiles coming in uh, and have to take them out down there. It's also set up for a big loiter time on uh, combat yes. air patrol, and so the air force got exactly what it asked for. It just uh, it's just not a fighter. That's uh, that's the thing. It's not a true blue uh, uh, fighter. Um, the bomber side of it is extremely successful and as we've always said you can't turn a bomber into a fighter but you can do it the, uh, the other way around. So um, uh, there was some great thing, the, the radar compared to the Phantom radar I'd, uh, I'd had was so much better. Uh, it wasn't as good as the F-18D radar that, oh, really? uh, that I'd had. Oh, no, okay. that, was, uh, that, was, that was brilliant, I absolutely brilliant. the F-3 brilliant. would have a better radar when, by the time you got to the F-3. F-3 had a better radar than the F-18A that I mm. flew and a better um, and the same weapons uh, suite so on the F-18D I had AMRAM um, on the F-18A I just had Sparrow which is basically sky flash um, with a bit more fuel in it um, so I was again you know there was uh, there was plenty it was not going to match up to a Hornet anywhere near it with handling but Bear in mind, 1v1 isn't really how we go to war. Yeah. 1v1 is something that we uh, do to puff our chests out a little bit on fighter squadrons. Um, but we go to war completely coordinated with other aeroplanes. This aeroplane also had the best data link of its time, uh, JTIDs. And um, our ability to um, coordinate with each other in a formation was, um, at the time, I think second to none. And, and that's what we maximise this aeroplane uh, uh, to do. And yeah, I think the mistake everyone says is like, oh, the, the F-3 was a rubbish dogfighter. It was like, wasn't designed for that. Just people, obviously the F uh, uh, category there, just they think it's a dogfighter if they don't know about the jet. It's an interceptor. That was it. And it's a good interceptor. Um, it really is. It, needs, it needed much more power at medium and high level, uh, though. If we're going to do high level intercept, you know this isn't uh, this isn't great for it, but it was it was there to stem the Russian hordes uh, coming over the border. Do you know what? It would have been a brilliant jet at low level in Germany where we operated our our Phantoms, and it was just a bit too late, uh, a bit too late for that. And we 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 bought something for the for the last war, not for the next uh, not for the next mm -hmm. war. I I, do, I don't have uh, I don't have a lot of um, uh, uh, let's say compassion for uh, for the aeroplane but uh, you know d don't get me wrong if you offered me a trip in one of these tomorrow I would bite your hand off <laughs> I, I really would because it's better to fly something uh, than it is to fly nothing and I had some great experiences in this uh, in this aeroplane it's just not the one that I would uh, that I would choose god that sounds awful I know yeah, it? it's I like, sound oh. awful <laughs> yeah but um, but have it, great it, selection to choose from yeah though, so, it is yeah. what it is you know yeah how did you find the wing sweep? Did you enjoy it, or was it a bit of a nuisance for you? A bit of a nuisance, uh, I think. I think probably with a bit more thought, they could have designed something that didn't need wing sweep, or we could have had um, we could have had um, auto wing sweep, which uh, the F-14 had and the Saudi F-3s had, I think, yeah, uh, at one did, point. Yeah. Um, but um, but it, it was it was just something else in the cockpit uh, to to deal with, Mike. It wasn't. It wasn't like um, it stopped me from flying or uh, stopped me from enjoying flying. It, w it was what it was. You see this thing behind us is in 67 wing. This is an absolute rocket ship in 67 wing. And I, I went the fastest I've ever been in an aeroplane in one of these. I went 1.7. And people had done Mach 2 in the Falkland Islands, just gone up and done a Mach 2 run. I got 1.7 out over the uh, North Sea. Mm -hmm. Took my breath away. <laughs> uh, it really did. Mm -hmm. um, um, I mean, we had to come down from, it, it was at night, we had to come down from 40,000 feet to, uh, to get it, and we were in an absolute screaming dive uh, to do it in 67 wing. Had to start pulling out at about uh, 15,000 feet, otherwise we'd have, we'd have just impacted mm -hmm. the sea. Once it had momentum, it, it, was, it was gone. Absolutely mm -hmm. gone, yeah. Right, I'm going to go a full-on, almost nerd, almost childlike question oh, here, because I don't think I've asked this before. <clears throat> Did you ever do like sort of like drag races over the sea? Because I've heard that a couple of times with people where you go up with an F-15, see so what accelerates better to a certain point. I'd never got uh, the opportunity to uh, uh, to do that. Never really raced uh, raced anybody, I suppose, in a uh, in an air. That's 
great idea. I feel like I've missed out. Yes, yeah, you know, I've heard taking a few one of my mates up and uh, and and doing that. I do remember once we were uh, we're on a red flag uh, mission, and uh, it was at the end of the uh, end of the mission, and we were running away, and we were chased down by um, by F-15s, and. Um, uh, we'd, uh, we'd, we'd had a lot of turning and burning and we were out of gas and me and my navigator we had to come out of afterburner otherwise we'd have run out of gas <laughs> and, uh, and we, were, we were going along at low level and we were fairly quick and then three more F3s from our formation all overtook us and I just thought, oh dear God, I know the missiles are hitting first if these F15s uh, get us. I think that's the only drag yeah. race I ever got into, Mike. Yeah, yeah, still pretty cool. Yeah. So you mentioned red flag there, yeah, how did the F3 fare out there? Actually exercise? it was a lot better, uh, it was a lot better than I think people ever thought it was going to be, including me. Um, the data link made us, um, gave us global situational awareness which a lot of other aeroplanes out there yeah. didn't have. Um, a lot of it was down at uh, down at low level, so we we were we were okay. We, we were okay there. Um, we and this is the thing, all right. So when I flew the Phantom, last thing I wanted to fly was a Tornado F3. It was the enemy. <laughs> when I flew the Hornet, why would I want to fly anything else? When I got onto the F3, we that it was the first red flag I went on with the Tornado F3, and there was a um, 617 squadron were there with their Tornado GR1s. They gave a um, everybody has to give a, a briefing at the start of uh, the exercise on the capabilities of your aeroplane. They didn't even ask us to give a capabilities <laughs> brief. That's, that's how much they thought of us. Wow. The 617 guy got up and said, uh, hi, I'm such and such from the world famous 617 squadron. Oh. You know, I thought, oh, fair enough, All right, he's proud of his squadron. He said, the first thing I want to say is, we're not the F3. And instantly, Ouch. all of us on 11 squadron just, well, I won't tell you what we, uh, uh, what we said. Not the camera. But I just thought, you come to us for some fighter support on this exercise, mate. You're on your own. You know, who, who it's even like says it? Own. <laughs> so here's the thing. I didn't particularly like the F3 compared to the other airplanes I flew. But when somebody slagged it off and I was on it, well, I'd have, I could have killed him. Essentially I could on have your killed team, him dead. you know, from yeah, <laughs> exactly. your Air Force. Yeah, don't, uh, don't, don't slag off my airplane, mate, until you've flown it, you know. Exactly, yeah. So how long did you spend on the F3 and did you enjoy it? I know you've said not really, but overall yeah. it must have been still cool. Okay, as um, I only got two years on the F3, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a, uh, in a second. Out of those two years, look, 50% of the time I had a hoot. 50% of the time it was more difficult than it needed to be and the aeroplane wasn't particularly serviceable uh, when I was on it. So a lot of my uh, frustration with it comes from the fact that I crewed out of a lot of aeroplanes uh, that I was starting up. And that was a huge frustration. And that gave me a jaundiced view of this, uh, of this aeroplane. What I want to do is remember, um, I, I flew the perfect trip in the Falkland Islands uh, in a Tornado F3, not in a Phantom, but in a Tornado F3. Oh. Uh, we went, I mean, ragingly supersonic. Uh, we escorted the uh, TriStar in, uh, we did all these uh, uh, amazing intercepts dropping down from on the high. It was a beautiful wow. day. We dropped in from 30,000 feet into the uh, six of somebody else and shot them down. And it was the perfect, uh, the perfect trip. And that's how I'd prefer to, uh, to remember the, the F3, is with those, just those snapshots of, of brilliance, uh, brilliance with it. And I've not flown it for a, for a while now, and so I'm starting to get that more romantic, uh, more romantic feel about it. I came in today and saw this, all right, there's no engines in it, but look at it. Hell's bells, <laughs> look at it. It looks spectacular. And the fact that I've actually flown this I know, one this actual model. and flew uh, the Iraq no fly zone uh, in it as well, so it's kind of like an operational thing uh, for me. Um, I've, actually, I've actually got a bit of, um, yeah, maybe a bit of love uh, for it uh, growing. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> That's one down. There you go. <laughs>Chuck, can you tell us about your new book that you have out at the moment? Uh, sure, yeah. I, um, I, I had a... Uh, I've always told stories, and uh, as pilots we always tell, uh, tell flying stories. And I just thought, rather than just tell them all the time, let's have a go at, uh, go at writing them down. So last year I wrote, uh, I wrote a book, and it's called, uh, there you go, Confessions of a, uh, Confessions of a Phantom Pilot. Um, and it's all the stories of um, what it was like being on the Phantom, uh, plenty of flying in there but it's not like the traditional aviation memoir uh, 
it's mostly about the lifestyle and uh, tell you the truth all the outrageous partying that we did during the cold war <laughs> what we want. Uh, yeah and all of the um camaraderie and and stuff and what it was like to live that that uh, fighter pilot life as a young man who didn't really know what he was doing uh, most of the time. So um, I wrote all these stories down, sent them off to a, a publisher, Font Hill Media, who just picked it up straight away. And I'm so pleased uh, uh, with them that, uh, that they did that. And uh, got it out there and, and it's, uh, uh, what is it, been described as a cracking good read by all my mates who are in it, you know, and are glad to be, uh, uh, glad to be um, mentioned in the, uh, in the whole thing. So um, I'm, I'm chuffed to bits about it, yeah. Did you enjoy the writing process? I did actually. I, I found uh, I found some of it quite cathartic, to tell you the truth. It's it's a warts and all thing, uh, uh, Mike. Um, I'll, I, there's plenty of my mistakes in there and things I wish I'd uh, I'd done better. So it was kind of good to get it off uh, off my chest. Uh, I've written about people I butted up against, uh, but I've also written about some of the best people in the world that I've ever ever met, and those are the people that I flew with. Um, some of the navigators uh, in there. Are just uh, just the best people in the world uh, that I've ever uh, ever come across. So th it's almost like a uh, it's like a love letter to the aeroplane and a love letter to those uh, those brilliant people as well. Do you think it's accessible to people who are not aviation geeks like myself and other? <coughs> <laughs> well, 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 that's what I tried to do. I tried to write stuff that is uh, interesting, even if you don't like uh, like aeroplanes. It's almost, I, I don't want it to sound cliched, but it's almost like a coming of, coming of age thing. I start off not really being very good and knowing a lot about what I was doing to being capable at the, uh, at the end of it, certainly more capable than I was when I, when I first started. And, uh, you know, somebody described it once as a, it's like a episode of men behaving badly. <laughs> so it's the sort of things that we got up to um, because the life was quite intense and we needed to blow off steam and and we by god we knew we knew how to blow up, blow off steam mm -hmm. and so where can we find it online uh so it's on it's on everywhere you'd normally get books it's uh it's big on uh, amazon you can go direct to font hill media um they're selling it uh, as well of course uh, being the publishers and then it's through wh smith uh, addy books all of those things that uh, that you'd normally find it on great stuff any more in the works yeah, yeah, the, the uh, second one, Confessions of a Flying Instructor. So me being that horrible uh, tactical weapons instructor that, that I hated when I was a student, uh, that's with the publisher right now. I'm hoping by the end of, uh, end of the year uh, that'll be out uh, uh, in print. And then next year, Confessions of a Hornet Pilot. And the final one uh, will be Confessions of a, um, a Tornado Pilot. Probably call that the final Confessions of a Fighter Pilot because uh, I meant to mention earlier, you said, how long did I get on the F3? Uh, I only got two years on it because after two years, I got discovered with a heart condition, got grounded and never flew again. So my final confessions will be out in book four of the trilogy. Brilliant stuff. Yeah. So we'll keep an eye out for that. So to wrap up, uh, do you have any hobbies? Um, I, I enjoy writing, all right, so um, that's become a uh, bit of a hobby. We've got two mad Dalmatians at home that keep <laughs> us on our toes. I think uh, I'm ashamed to say probably our biggest hobby at home is gin. Uh, I've got a brilliant gin bar and we, we make up our own cocktails oh, and uh, stuff. It does sound like a, a real athlete, <laughs> uh, uh, don't I? Uh, but that's it. I, I think we, uh, we tend to socialise and um, uh, entertain uh, quite a bit and that's where we put all of our uh, energies into, uh, into that. One of the, uh, if you could take up one aircraft you've flown in junior career one more time, which would it be? Do you know, yeah, you, asked, you sent me this question. I was, I've been thinking all through uh, last night, uh, and I'm going to uh, gonna give you a bad answer, I, I think, because I'm going to say all three. I, I, I said to you, if you offered me a trip in this tomorrow, I'd bite your hand off, um, because, like I said, I'd, I'd rather fly than, than not fly. If I had one trip and I was going up and I needed to fight against somebody, then I'd, it, it, this, hands down it would be the Hornet. I think I could take a Hornet airborne this afternoon and still be able to fly it. It was that, that easy and that, uh, that friendly to you. But with my romantic head on, if you gave me one trip and one trip only, uh, it would be in a Phantom with one of my uh, favorite navs. That's it, because I, I truly, I truly lived life uh, when I was flying that, mm -hmm. that aeroplane. One aircraft you would love to fly, either past or present? 
Yeah, I d I've, um, lots of people have been talking about um, Spitfires uh, of late, and then I, I came across somebody who said they said that their father had a, um, a Mustang, uh, and I reckon that would be it. Uh, looked, I mean, Spitfire-like uh, like qualities, looked a little bit bulbous, but with that beautiful bubble canopy, I reckon that's, uh, that'd be worth a trip. Yeah, that's the most common answer. Well, not Mustang, but Spitfire every time. I always expect something like F-14 or something because it's in the movie, but it's always Spitfire or Blackbird or something like yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or oh, something untouchable like a Blackbird would be, would be pretty cool, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, Tug, thank you very much for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure. Uh, and for me too, Mike. Nice to see you.